Good evening, all of you that are with us live this evening and all of you who will be joining on the YouTube channel at some point in the future. Um, you're all uh, you're all very welcome. Um, just a couple of things before we get going with the main event. Um, if you're planning on coming to either the um, uh, Popular Astronomy Conference uh, in Kettering on the uh, 19th, then do drop by and say hello. Um, the Radio Astronomy section and Eucra will be there and it'd be good to say hi to people face to face. Um, we've got the Winchester weekend coming up and again, we will be there. So do drop by and introduce yourselves. Look forward to that. Um, next month, we're looking at um, past gamma ray bursts from Prof Mundell. I think she's from Bath, yeah, from Bath, uh, Bath University. So that should be interesting. Um, as will this evening. Um, the topic, the topic tonight, um, aurora clouds and polar mesospheric uh, summer echoes are just on the on the edge of radio astronomy. But as I as I commented earlier, um, we're all very interested in learning stuff, and um, a, a day without learning, in my view, is a day wasted. So I'm very pleased to um, introduce uh, David Hooper from. Um, the Rutherford uh, Appleton uh, Laboratory. Um, David, I know, has a has a passion and a heart for uh, for STEM and inspiring uh, youngsters, as do the BAA and and indeed the um, the, the radio astronomy section. So, um, without further um, without further ado and waffle for me, I hand over to uh, to David. David uh, David Hooper. Dave, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just bring up my screen. And get that full screen mode. And have you got full screen mode? Yeah, it's all working. Okay, that's great. And the only final thing to say to you, Paul, is I'm looking at my watch here. I'm aiming for about 45 minutes. If I start running over, do let me know. Um, but I hopefully I'll have just about the right amount. So the first thing to say, my title is ever so slightly different to what Paul advertised. So unfortunately, no Aurora in this talk. But as he said, it, it it's on the edge of what you would consider with astronomy. And certainly you've got the noctilucent cloud section here. So there'll be some things that are a bit familiar. And just to also point out my affiliation, I'm based at the STFC Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the Royal Space Department, but in fact, the work that I'll be presenting here, uh, the background to it, is actually done under the auspices of something called the National Centre for Atmospheric Science, NCAS, which is a distributed research centre spread across a number of universities and other research departments. And if I just go to my first slide then, so I'm just going to reiterate what my talk's going to be about. Uh, basically, it's about two related phenomena that rely on the formation of ice crystals at high altitudes during the midsummer months. And uh, what you think of high altitude, I'll be coming on showing a bit more detail about how far the atmosphere extends. And the first thing is there's noctilucent clouds or NLCs, and they form at an altitude of around about 82 kilometers above the ground level. And to put that in context, for people living in the British Isles or certainly middle altitudes, the highest clouds other clouds or sort of regular clouds you're likely to see will be maximum altitude of about 12 kilometers. So these are really unusual noctilucent clouds. They're about 70 kilometers above all other clouds. Now they can in principle occur at any time of day, but one of the things I'll be showing you in this talk is that they're only visible to the naked eye during twilight hours. And I'll come on to why that is in a while. And um, so some of you, as I said, you, you've got a aurora and noctilucent cloud section. So those will be familiar to you. The thing that's probably less familiar is this phenomenon, phenomenon called polar mesosphere summer echoes. And these are types of strong radar echoes seen by atmospheric radars that are basically operating in, operating in the VHF range. So VHF is 30 to 300 megahertz. And typically they're seen from sort of high 40s. I don't think you tend to get really radars operating um, below that, up to certainly up into a few hundred megahertz. They occur between 80 and 90 kilometers altitude. So same sort of altitude overlapping with the noctilucent clouds. 
Uh, the difference here is they can only occur during daylight hours. It, it's not to do with visibility. They can only occur, whereas, as I say, with noctilucent clouds, it's a matter of when they're visible. And just to give a bit more background, I'm fundamentally an atmospheric scientist, um, if you like, a meteorologist. So my speciality is much more the lower atmosphere. Um, this is also an area that I've been researching into, but even for atmospheric physicists and scientists, the, this part of the atmosphere is really quite remote. Um, well, it, it's it's not so important as other parts of the atmosphere for a number of reasons, and I'll come across some of those. But the other problem is being at those sort of altitudes that it's too high to be reached by balloons, and it's a bit too low to be visited by satellites. You can actually send scientific rockets, and I won't be presenting that in this presentation, but that does inform some of the, the research in this area. And the final thing to say is just an apology for anybody who's colorblind. I'd be surprised with 40 people here if there wasn't somebody, who, if you didn't have any. Um, I have a colleague who's colorblind, so I'm aware of the issues. Some my newer slides, I've taken that into account. Some of the older slides, not so much. So I apologize for anything that doesn't show up very clearly for you. So I'm just going to start with a bit of a diversion. Well, this is just to show, I've mentioned about NCAS, National Center for Atmospheric Science. It has a number of what it calls atmospheric observatories. Uh, I'm just showing four of them there. Now, the key ones in this talk is the Chilbolton one in southern England, down here, 51.15 degrees north. And that's where I have a noctilucent cloud camera. And the other site is this one on the west coast of Wales, Capeldowy, which is near Aberystwyth. And that's where we have a VHF radar, which we're seeing the PMSEs with. And so just to show you, I'm going to go off a little diversion here. So as I mentioned, I realized a lot of the people, the background is radio astronomy, and that's not really something I've done. Um, but I'm going to show you something here to show um, sort of the old adage that one person's noise is another person's signal. And I'm going to show you here um, at the beginning some noise from the radar, which actually shows that we can do some quite primitive radio astronomy. So. I'll explain what MST stands for in MST radar in a while. The key thing is it's operating at 46.5 megahertz, so it's 6.45 meters wavelength. And you can't really tell the scale from here, but each of these Yagi antennas is about four and a half meters tall. So this antenna array is really quite large. It's a 20 by 20 array, so 400 antennas, and it covers approximately 100 meters by 100 meters. And I'm guessing that for the radio astronomy amongst you, you're probably looking at that and thinking, oh, that'll make a really nice radio telescope. In principle, the answer is yes. In practice, the way it was designed, this is showing the available beam pointing directions. So this is an example of what's called a phased array. If people know about the LOFAR um, radio astronomy telescopes, they operate in a similar principle, but they're much newer and they're more, much more flexible. So this was only designed to steer in a few beam pointing directions. So you can see there's 17 beam pointing directions. And the red lines, which I'm afraid for the people colorblind, that'll be hard to see, but the, the concentric circles going outwards show that we can go at 4.2, 6 degrees, 8.5 degrees, or 12 degrees off vertical. So we're really looking, we're nominally vertically pointing, and we've got eight potential azimuths that we can point in. And the yellow, well, if those yellow bits there, they're just showing the, the beams we tend to use, which is the vertically observing beam, and then four beams that are six degrees off vertical in different azimuths. So from a radio telescope point of view, this is not obviously going to be particularly good. It's a bit limited. Another issue is because we're operating at quite a low frequency, the one-way half power, half width of the beam is one and a half degrees, which is pretty wide, really. So... But nevertheless, as I said, what I'm going to show you here, this is a plot from about a week ago. What I'm showing you is the, the noise power. So like I said, this is the bit we throw away um, from five of those beam pointing directions. And because we're fixed pointing directions, then during the day, we're effectively sweeping out a circle of fixed declination. And so you can see I'm going there between 47 degrees and 57.7 degrees. Um, and I'm... Pointing out the top there, Cassiopeia A, which now I'm not the radio astronomer here, so I believe that's a remnant of a supernova. And that's at 58.8 degrees declination. And the key thing, the only thing I really want you to notice here is this big spike here. That is the, tran I don't know if you'd call it a transit, but that's the passage of Cassiopeia A source 
coming through our radar beam. And the reason it's so fat is like I say, because our beam width is quite fat. So that's just to show that we, we can do a sort of a, a primitive type of radio astronomy. And I'm afraid that is it for radio astronomy in this talk, but there will be some sort of radio physics, um, which I'm more familiar with. So moving on to the main chunk of the talk. As I said, what I'm gonna do here, I'm not sure how much people know about the atmosphere from an atmospheric physics point of view. So I'm starting from, like I say, expertise in the lower atmosphere and working upwards. So I'm just gonna spend a bit of time giving you the context of the part of the atmosphere that the talk is really about. <clears throat> so what I'm showing here is a profile of temperature for what's called the standard atmosphere. And a standard atmosphere is basically an average atmosphere, averaged over all seasons and over all latitudes. So it represents the basic structure of the atmosphere, which you'll see everywhere. The numbers will change a bit and the heights will change. And you can see here, so the MST and MST radar actually is the mesosphere, stratosphere, troposphere. And what you can see here is that these parts of the atmosphere divided up depending on the predominant temperature gradient. So in the troposphere, you've got temperature decreasing with increasing altitude. Stratosphere, it's increasing. Mesosphere, it's decreasing. And then finally, the thermosphere. So I'm showing this plot up to 110 kilometers. I think the standard atmosphere technically only goes up to about, I think just below 90 kilometers. Um, so though, that, those are the names of the regions. And the next thing to show is we also name the dividing points, the break points between these regions. So the tropopause, which I'll mention briefly again, is uh, basically the top of the troposphere, base of the stratosphere. And the stratopause is then the division between stratosphere and mesosphere. And then mesopause, that's an important term. So hopefully I've got the right slide. So you can see that the region of interest for this talk is basically around the mesosphere. So just sort of either, either side of the mesopause really. And just to explain why the temperature structure looks like this, um, generally you'd find temperature tends to decrease with altitude. But what we've got here are examples, two regions, the thermosphere and the stratosphere, where we have absorption of solar radiation. So it, it's an example of radiative transfer. So for example, greenhouse effect is something actually in the troposphere, but that's absorption of radiation. In fact, well, then it tends to be long wave radiation from the earth but it's that same term, radiative transfer. So thinking of the sunlight coming from the top of the atmosphere, the thermosphere then absorbs the X-rays and EUV is extreme ultraviolet. And that's obviously a very good thing because those are fairly nasty parts of the spectrum for life on earth. And if you only know one thing about the stratosphere, it's probably the existence of ozone and the fact that that absorbs ultraviolet radiation, which again is quite an important thing. So that's what in both of those areas, if you're absorbing energy, that's what causes the temperatures to increase. So that explains what those regions are. Um, so, okay, uh, this is the only equation I'm gonna show you in here. So I'm just gonna, if, you, you, if you're not interested in this, you can gloss over, but this is something people may well have come across and it will explain really what I'm trying to explain here is not so much the numbers, but the meaning of the terms. So the combined gas law, if you take, two parcels of gas or well you take one parcel of gas and you can define it in terms of p is the pressure and pressure is force per unit area so for example if you're going on a flight taking off from an airport and your ears pop that's because the atmospheric pressure is decreasing in the cabin at least until you get to about a couple of kilometers up so pressure you can sort of feel the force of things and you don't notice it mostly because it's all around you V is the volume, um, so you have to, I'll, I'll be showing you in a moment, a sort of idealized volume container of gas. And then T is the temperature, and the key thing here is it's absolute temperature, which means in Kelvin, not in degrees, which I've just shown you on the previous slide. And another concept we have is we tend to, so pressure and temperature are two of the fundamental ways of defining the atmosphere and things we tend to measure. Um, but we don't tend to measure volume, but instead, one other thing we might measure is density. So I'm showing here the Greek letter rho, and density is mass per unit volume. So effectively, how thick, how many molecules in a given volume of gas? I'm sorry, I should have said that combined gas law is for a fixed mass of gas. So if you change any of those, pressure, volume, density, 
um, or temperature, the others will have to adjust to compensate for that. And, and just one thing about density, I'm not gonna focus so much on density, um, but like I say, density is, the, if you like, the thickness of the atmosphere. So as you go up in altitude and find it harder to breathe, um, that's because the density is going low more, I think, more than the pressure. But what you'll see in a moment is that pressure and density tend to vary in a very similar sort of way. Uh, the numbers are quite a little bit different because temperature would also vary. And so like I said, I'm just putting that for background. And I'm just going to show you some consequences of that now. So this is really quite basic gas type physics. What I'm intending to show there, it doesn't look so good at the moment, it'll look better when you see the next ones, is the idea of a piston trapping air in a cylinder. And the reason I'm showing it as a piston, I'll come on to in a moment. And I'm defining then the gas within that cylinder, the green, well, it's green for reasons that will become obvious. So it's got a volume one, density, row one, pressure one, temperature one. Now, if you compress that gas, and so now you can see that why my cylinder looks like that, and by definition, if you're compressing it, you're gonna reduce the volume. So V2 is less than V1. Also by definition, if you reduce the volume, um, your density is mass per unit volume and your mass is fixed. So your density has to increase and the pressure will also increase. So the way to think of this is a bit like a bicycle pump. And that's what I was thinking when I came up with this diagram. If you think of compressing the air in a bicycle pump with your finger on the end, um, what you'll find is that your force per unit area that you're forcing the piston down, so that's giving you a pressure, will eventually be matched by the pressure of the gas itself pushing back up the force per unit area of the mass. And if those two are out of balance, so if you're pushing with more force per unit area on the piston, then the piston goes down. But if your pressure is increased in the gas, and it's greater than the force per unit area if you're pushing your piston, then it'll force your um, piston back up. So if you think of it with a bicycle pump, put your finger on the bottom, squeeze it, let go, and the piston will pump back up. Um, so that's the main thing I'm trying to explain to you here are the volume, density, and pressure. But another consequence, which will come up occasionally in this talk, is that when you compress a gas, the temperature will increase. And again, with a bicycle pump idea, you can usually feel that if you do it quickly enough. I mean, in fact, the heat from the gas will quickly dissipate and heat the pump, but it, if you pumping the tire quickly, you will feel that increase in temperature, a slight increase. So the opposite then is if you expand a gas or you could say decompress, I think I use that word later. So if you're expanding the gas and by definition your volume increases and that means by definition your density will decrease and so again pressure follows density fairly well pressure will decrease but also your temperature will decrease and in fact when for the part of the atmosphere that I'm really interested this expansion leading to cooling is actually going to be really really important so that's your background with basic gas physics so let's go back to the curves and what you can see now is that of added pressure. And what you can see is that pressure decreases exponentially. And just to point out, because it's decreasing exponentially, it looks like it's hitting the, the axis there. But in fact, if I was to scale that up, you'd see it would keep decreasing exponentially, but just with smaller numbers. And as I've said, in the piston example, you're gonna match your pressure to the force per unit area on top. And in this case, in the atmosphere, if you like, the force pushing down on the piston of the gas is the weight of all of the atmosphere above it. And so the reason you've got the exponential decrease is that when you are at ground level, and you see where my mouse has gone, um, you've got the whole weight of the atmosphere pushing down from above. So you've got your maximum pressure. If you go up a little bit, then you've got most of the atmosphere above you minus a little bit. So your pressure will be slightly decreased and you go up again and it will, you've progressively more atmosphere beneath you and less above you. And so that's why you've got this decrease in pressure. Now, one thing that may be surprising because this pressure decreases really quite quickly. So if I take an altitude of five kilometers in the atmosphere is that already at five kilometers above ground level um, and to give an example, I think, Things like I'm pretty sure Tibetan plateaus are around about five kilometers and parts of the higher mountain chains. Um, you've got 50% of the mass already beneath you when you're only five kilometers up. 
and the density, like I say, it sort of tracks along a bit with the pressure. It's decreased to 60% of what you'd get at the ground level. So I think around about five kilometers is the highest permanently occupied habitations you would get. And like I said, I think it's places like um, Tibet, which would get that. Um, 60% of density, by the way. So for a person who lives at sea level, you would feel that. In fact, I once went to a conference in Peru and even at two and a half thousand meters above sea level, you'll start to feel uh, not altitude sickness, but you'll start to feel that the air is less dense and you've got less oxygen. And I think, I'm not sure, for certainly for Everest, I think you would acclimatize even before you get to five kilometers up um, because you would have trouble breathing. My next level in the atmosphere, I've normally taken 11 kilometers. Um, just note that is consistent. That's about the height of the tropopause at middle altitudes. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. So up at 11 kilometers, and that's around about the height that commercial airliners cruise, the density of the atmosphere is now reduced to 30% of what you get at ground level. And aircraft have to be pressurized because, well, even the top of Everest is just shy of nine kilometers and most people need oxygen there. So you, you're out of the realms of habitability. Um, you've now got 78% of the mass. So over three quarters of the mass, of the atmosphere is beneath you. And I've written here 98% of H2O. So I'm, what I mean is actually water vapor. And in fact, what that really means is not below 11 kilometers, but within the troposphere. So in the tropics, the tropopause is a bit higher, can go up to about 18 kilometers. Uh, middle altitudes, it's around about 11 or so. And in the polar regions, it's actually lower. It can go down to maybe six or seven kilometers. And the point of that is that all of the weather that we're typically familiar with and all the clouds, they're all within the troposphere. So hopefully in this next photo, you'll be able to see. So this at the bottom here, hopefully you can see is a nice example of a cumulonimbus cloud. Um, if people are interested in the atmospheric side, you can just about see what looks like some mammatus there, um, which I don't see very often. Um, but like I say, this is really what I want you to focus on, this cumulonimbus. And the cumulonimbus, the base might be about a kilometre above the ground, but the top of it will go typically right the way up to the tropopause. And again, the, well, the word stratosphere implies stratified layered. And the reason for that, sorry, let me quickly go back. Um, when you have an increase of temperature with increasing altitude, that gives very high stability. It's very resistant to vertical motion. So when your cumulonimbus cloud goes up and hits the tropopause, it, it can't really penetrate particularly far. It might slightly overshoot. And then usually the winds at that height are stronger than low down, which is why then you can see that anvil being spread out by the winds. But basically, it's going to be capped by the tropopause. So all the clouds we normally see are within the troposphere. In fact, all the weather we see, everything we recognize as weather is all within the troposphere. Uh, the next point, I'm not going to go into a great deal, but there are ways that you can connect the troposphere to the higher parts of the atmosphere, but typically they're fairly decoupled. So uh, let me just, sorry, I'm just going to make another point I've forgotten to mention. So you generally, like I say, you can get slight overshooting of air in a cumulonimbus from the troposphere into the very base of the stratosphere. But typically, those two parts of the atmosphere are fairly decoupled in the sense the time scales for mix of gas between the two regions are, you know, you're talking years. And another thing is if you, well, the other way to get things into the stratosphere and the ground level would be, for example, very intense volcanic activity. So the recent eruption in Tonga actually went up to at least 35 kilometers, I think, for the main part of the eruption. And you inject particles then into the stratosphere, they'll stay there for years because it's so stable. So anything above the tropopause basically is another world and we don't generally have much experience of it in our day-to-day -day lives. So another thing, I'm not gonna go into this in a great deal of effort, but another way of coupling the lower atmosphere to the upper atmosphere is through things called gravity waves. Um, and by the way, those are not the same as gravitational waves you get in astronomy. Uh, another word for a gravity wave, which is slightly more descriptive, is a buoyancy wave. And I'm just showing you one example, which is mountain waves, because they're very simple to understand. So what I'm showing here figuratively is wind blowing over a mountain. And what you'll find is that then the wind will oscillate to some extent downstream of the, of the mountain. Um, 
or to the lee of the mountain is one way of calling it. Um, but depending on the conditions, it will also propagate vertically. And if you get the right conditions, that can propagate from the lower atmosphere right the way up through the rest of the atmosphere. So you can send some energy from the wind in the lower atmosphere then up to the regions we're interested in this talk. And I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on it, but gravity waves are very important there. Um, my clouds there, if you've ever seen a lenticular cloud, you'll know that that's actually quite an appropriate shape. They are lens shaped. That's not just me being very bad at drawing a cloud. And the reason you get these lenticular clouds is um, this goes back to my combined gas law, where in the rising portions of the wave, you've got a decompression of the air and therefore you've got cooling. And so if you cool it enough, you can then just get the water vapor to come out and form a cloud. Um, I did mean to stick a picture of a lenticular in there. They're worth looking up because they really can be very spectacular. Um, but the point, the only point I want to make here is this is a way of linking some of the dynamics of the lower atmosphere to the higher atmosphere. So the next level I'm going to choose is well up in the stratosphere. And if you remember back from 2012, there's a man called Felix Baumgartner who did the record-breaking highest parachute jump from 39.1 kilometers. And at that altitude, the atmosphere is already very, very thin. So 0.4% of the density at ground level. And at that altitude, you've got 99.7% of the mass beneath you. Now, just looking at the density part, I think it was in the early 60s, there was a man, I think his name was Joseph Kittinger. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. I think he was a US Air Force. In fact, he was on the team that helped Felix Baumgartner doing his jump. And I remember reading an example of a description of this earlier jump. And one of the things that this guy had said was the atmosphere was so thin, he didn't feel like he was falling because when you do a parachute jump from lower down, you've got higher density. So you've got the feeling of the wind rushing past you. Whereas in this very, very thin part of the atmosphere, it just doesn't feel like there's any atmosphere. So you don't, you don't feel, he didn't feel like he's falling for quite a long way. So very, very thin part of the atmosphere. And obviously you can see if you got there on a balloon, balloons can go up to about that height. I think some aircraft can, but even the spy planes from the Cold War only tended to go to about 20 kilometers. So this is already well above what we're used to seeing in the atmosphere. So finally up to our region of interest between 80 and 90 kilometers. And I've picked an altitude here, representative one of 82 kilometers which is where you get the noctilucent clouds. And again, the key point where you've got 99.999% of the mass of the atmosphere is below you. So it almost seems a negligible amount of the atmosphere above. And the density is 0.001%. So it's 100,000 of what you would get at the ground level. So it's very, very thin. And that's really all these slides have just been trying to show you that it's an extremely thin part of the atmosphere. And also you can see there, well, the water vapor less than 10 parts per million by volume. Um, that will make more sense when I show you in a moment a profile of some actual data. Um, but it's also extremely dry. Um, so it's a very surprising you're going to get clouds of any sort forming there. And my final height, I'm not going to go into great detail on this. So I'm just showing you 100 kilometers is a representative altitude where you're going to get suborbital rockets um, so those can be, well, in recent years, there's obviously been a few from last year or two, quite a few of those, but traditionally those would be scientific rockets. And it's also the sort of altitude for the aurora and also the altitude where meteors burn up. Now, key thing here is I've said how thin the atmosphere is at these heights, um, but obviously it really depends, that thinness depends on what you're doing or the significance. And if you're a meteor coming in at very high velocity, even at that low, very low density, it will obviously still burn up from the friction. And if you think of things like in low Earth orbit, like the International Space Station is a few hundred kilometers up, it has to boost its orbit every now and then because the drag of the speed it's going will mean the orbit decays slightly. So even though the atmosphere looks neg negligibly thin here, and by the way, the atmosphere can be said to go up at least a few hundred kilometers above this, and I think around about 500 kilometers or so, so it becomes the exosphere where you, you're sort of merging with the solar wind, basically. So the atmosphere doesn't really have a hard stop point. So that was all the background to give you the context of this part of the atmosphere. So, oh, the final thing, this is quite an important one. I know 
when it comes to astronomy, there's often quite a big overlap with amateur radio things. So I'm guessing people will be familiar with this. I already mentioned that the thermosphere, the temperature increase is caused by that absorption of X-rays in extreme ultraviolet. It also gives moderate ionization. So this also constitutes the E layer of the um, ionosphere. Now in the top of the mesosphere, it, it's a different thing. So Lyman alpha, it's one of, I think it's one of the hydrogen bands. I'm sure someone here can tell me, um, but it, it's a particular wavelength that you get absorption in the atmosphere. And I'm pretty sure it's NO, which I think is nitric oxide, absorbs it. it it's quite weak ionization and it only occurs during daylight hours. So I've mentioned, I'm moving now towards the radar echoes. And I'd already mentioned they're only seen during, sorry, they only occur during daylight hours. So that's the context that we're a very thin part of the atmosphere with weak ionization. So what I'm showing here now is figuratively what causes the radar echoes. And by the way, we do get echoes uh, other times a year, not just in the summer. And so what I'm showing here figuratively is a density of electron, sorry, a gradient, vertical gradient of electron density and figuratively, what I'm showing there with those circles are turbulent eddies. And the reason you can get turbulence at these altitudes, I've mentioned about gravity waves. You've also got tides and diurnal, semi-diurnal tides. You've also got longer period planetary waves. So there's all sorts of waves can interact. And if you get the right conditions, you can get breakdown for turbulence. And turbulent mixing starts off at the larger scale with these. It's a super, you can think of it as a superposition of vortices, so sort of circular type of motions. And the energy cascades from the larger sizes down to the progressively smaller sizes. So if you apply that mixing across a vertical gradient of electron density, in the short time scale, you would expect as things move, they retain the electron density of where they originated. So after a bit of time, you might get something that looks like this. And this would change over time the exact profile, but you basically, um, what I'm showing with those arrows is that if you start off with something here and it ends up here, like I say, it would retain, certainly in the short time scale, we'd expect it to retain that electron density on very short time scales. And over time, this profile pattern would change, but what you've actually got here is a spectrum of scale sizes within the turbulent layer. And statistically, that would remain the same. So I'm not going to explain this, but if anybody's familiar with turbulent spectra, you expect it's a K minus five third spectrum. So you've got most of the energy at the larger scales, and then it decreases into the smaller scales. And eventually, it just dissipates as heat through viscosity. And the key thing with the radars is that they will pick out those irregularities that are half the wavelength of the radar. So I've mentioned the 46.5 megahertz radar, 6.45 meter wavelength. So we're picking out scale sizes that are around about three meters. And it's sometimes called Bragg scatter. And so the idea of the half wavelength is to get constructive interference. If you go over a half wavelength, then the total path length change is one wavelength. So you get constructive interference. So most of the year, if we get any radar echoes at all from the mesosphere, they do tend to be weak. Um, this is not a very strong process um, and they're not particularly long lasting echoes. But the key thing is we do need a vertical gradient of electron density. If there's no gradient, mix it as much as you like and there's still no gradient. Um, but also we need the turbulence. So that's the, the idea behind the radar echoes. So I'm doing here, on the right side, showing some non-summer echoes. I'm not calling them winter echoes because basically in this context, non-summer is early August, right the way through to late May the next year. Summer echoes over the British Isles is around about potentially late, late, late May, sorry, through to potentially early August. Uh, now, one of the things that you hopefully can see here is these summer echoes, they're not always, but they can be much, much longer lasting than anything we get in the winter, sorry, non-summer. Another thing you might be able to see is they do tend to be stronger. And I'll show you that again in a moment, but I've just shown one up at the top there. They can sometimes be quite weak and not very long lasting and not very vertically thick. So they can look a lot more like non-summer ones. And I'll 
mention that point again. That's actually a research point, so I'm not going to go into it too much. So I'm just going to show that same information as a couple of distributions. So the one on the left, I'm looking here now through 10 years of radar data from this MST radar, Kapil Dawi. And hopefully you can, even if you're colorblind, you'll be able to distinguish those two lines. So during the summer, these echoes are almost exclusively between 80 and 90 kilometers. Whereas outside of the summer, they predominantly below 80, but you can see there is a bit of overlap. And here was the other point about radar power is that during the summer time, the distribution of signal strength is shifted to higher values. Oops. Going the wrong way, sorry about that. Uh, okay, that's where I need to be. Um, you shifted towards stronger echoes in the summer, but there is a large overlap here. And my suspicion is because we typically, the PMSEs are studied at much higher latitudes, sort of around about pole wood of 65 degrees. Um, we're at 52.4 degrees where this radar is, and it's not entirely clear if all the radar echoes we see in the summer months are the PMSE class, but if they're long lasting and they're strong, then we can say they, they definitely are PMSE class, um, but maybe not all of them are. So like I say, that's got a lot of research just hidden in a quick comment there. Okay, so, oh, so I'm going to go back quickly. I apologies for going back to this. I'm not going to go into great detail, but the difference in the summer, um, I've mentioned it relies on ice crystals. Now, what happens with the ice crystals? Um, they're very small ice crystals, but the electrons can effectively stick to them. And the what we're seeing with the radar depends on free electrons. And what you would tend to get is what's called bite outs. And this has been seen with rockets. In the altitude regions where there's ice crystals, you can see some sudden reduction in electron density. And my understanding, I'm not sure if this is entirely correct, but my understanding is then those bite outs would give you much stronger gradients to begin with on your mixing. Um, but one way or the other, we see these much stronger echoes in the summer. And we know from rocket experiments and other things at high latitudes that they are related to the ice crystals. So now I'm getting on to why do we get ice crystals in the summer? And I've taken this plot modified from a paper. And just to show you, so we're going in altitude between 50 and 100 kilometers, and that's 90 degrees there. That's the summer pole. Um, so this is for July, and the minus 90 degrees is the winter pole. And um, if you were to look in the stratosphere, the global circulation, what's called the meridional circulation, um, so along the lines of merid um, meridional lines, north south, that is, in the stratosphere or in the lower part, it tends to be from the equator to the poles on either side. Whereas in the mesosphere, and I'm not going to go into the reasons why, you've got the circulation is from the summer pole to the winter pole. And in order to conserve that, if you think of the sphere, the poles, everything groups together. So to keep the flow going, that means you've got to draw air up over the summer pole, and then it gets pushed down at the winter pole. And this was one of the slides I've already mentioned, that when you get expansion of air, you get cooling. So that's what you've got there. The upward motion gives you decompression, and that leads to cooling. So that's why this part of the atmosphere is particularly cold. And I'm just relaying that with some colours just to really demonstrate that. And apologies again for people who can't see red. But what you can see is basically that the most intense cooling is really polewood of 60 degrees north. Um, and for the British Isles, we're between about more mainland Britain, between 50 and 60 degrees north. And we're we haven't really got so much cooling there, but we do get the outflow of that cold air from the pole, from the summer pole. So that's why we get this very cold temperature. So it's rather counterintuitively that in the summer you might think you get warmer temperatures, but no, you get much, much cooler. So now I'm going to show you some data actually from a satellite. So this is NASA's Aura satellite, and there's the MLS instrument, which measures a number of things. So uh, th these are real data here. So um, hopefully you'll be able to see there, you can see that troposphere down there, stratosphere, and then the mesosphere. In fact, the mesopause here does look quite high up in the winter. So I've taken a, a date in January and I'm showing here the frost point. Now the frost point, oh, let me just quickly mention the water vapor. 
So I'd already mentioned that we're at the heights we're interested in, and we've got below 10 parts per million by volume. So you can see the massive reduction in water vapor at the tropopause. And what you can see, there's a slight increase here in the profile, not very big. And the reason for this is it's basically photochemistry. So methane will oxidize into water vapor. So you get a slight increase. Uh, this is a winter time profile, by the way. You get slight increase in the higher altitudes, but it's quite small. And your frost point depends both on the amount of water vapor, but also on the pressure. Um, so for example, as you go up in altitude, the boiling point, of water, boiling point of water reduces, but also the frost point because the pressure decreases. So that's why you've got this very strong decrease in the frost point. And you can see there for the winter, there's just no way you're going to get frost or ice crystals forming anywhere above the tropopause. And as I said, all the clouds then you're familiar with will be in the troposphere. So now if I show a summer profile, and by the way, this profile I picked for 51.7 degrees north. Um, so it, it's around about southern England. A summer profile now for the same uh, latitude. The first thing to mention, so I've mentioned, okay, so in the summer, we're absorbing ultraviolet by ozone, and that's in the summer you've got more ultraviolet. So that's why the stratosphere gets warmer. And then, like I say, counterintuitively, you've got that cooling of the mesopause region. And you can see in this example, okay, we haven't quite touched the frost point and it's quite rare at these low latitudes to see that. And I'll show you another example of that in a moment, um, but we're very close to the frost point there, much, much colder temperatures. And in fact, the mesopause, the summer mesopause at high latitudes is the coldest part of the whole earth atmosphere system. So very, very cold temperatures. And so even though it's extremely thin atmosphere, and it's extremely dry, it gets so cold that you do get formation of ice. So that I'm just showing there then again, yeah, that you get a slight increase in the water vapor at the higher altitudes during the summer. And that was what I called the adiabatic cooling. So from the vertical motion, decompression gives cooling. And that's what drives those temperatures. So uh, this one again, I'll apologize. I suspect this is gonna be quite tough if you're not good with red colors. Um, this is again from the Aura MLS satellite, and I'm showing here the temperature relative to the frost point at the around about the NLC altitude, so 83 kilometers. And so I'm showing between 40 and 70 degrees north, and that white line that runs across that should be representative of Chilbolton, so southern England, 51.15 north. And I'm running there, you can see from early May through till the end of August. And the key points to note here, so anywhere that's blue is where we get below the frost point. And you can see that that period where you get very cold temperatures, the further north you are, the further polewood you are, uh, the longer it lasts. So it can be sort of latish May um, when you're up to 70 degrees north or even further north. And by the time you come down to the British latitudes, um, you're lucky to get any periods. In fact, there are one or two. If you look really closely, there are a couple of periods where these temperatures below the frost point do get down to southern English um, latitudes. And in fact, in really exceptional times, it can go to the high 40s, um, but that really is exceptional. Um, so you might think in the south of England, that doesn't look very good for seeing noctilucent clouds. Um, but the good thing, they're so high up, you can actually see them from a very long way away. So what this map is showing, so there's our NLC camera, southern England. And just for reference, that's the way the MST radar is. Uh, two degrees above the horizon is probably, if you have a really good horizon and you've got no tropospheric cloud, you, you may well be able to see something as low as two degrees above the horizon. It's a little bit marginal. But the point here, see how far away they are. From the south of England, I could potentially see noctuous and clouds right the way to the north of mainland Britain, so the north of Scotland. Um, more typically, if you're lucky, you would hope that you're going to get some noctilucent clouds more down to the sort of middle middle of the British latitudes. So you might think being further north is good because you're getting further north towards where it's colder, so you've got more of a chance of seeing noctilucent clouds. And that is true, but at the same time, you're battling the sunlight, and because obviously the nights don't get very dark during this midsummer period. So 
the sweet spot is actually going to be from around about northern England, maybe central Scotland are the best latitudes. But like I say, you will occasionally see noctilucent clouds even from southern England. So um, what I'm just trying to show here figuratively is how the not the geometry of how noctilucent clouds appear. So obviously my green bits down the bottom, that's just showing the Earth. And I'm figuratively showing different parts of the atmosphere here with different brightnesses of blue. Um, and what I'm showing, so there's my noctilucent clouds at high altitude. Uh, and there's my vertical and horizontal viewing. And at the moment, I'm showing the direction the sun is coming from the left inward. So at the moment, I'm showing at the moment of sunset. Now, by the way, you're much better off seeing noctilucent clouds in the dawn than the dusk, but I'll just go with this one just to show you the principle. And as the sun's setting, the sky is too bright because as you're looking vertically, you're effectively blinded by the scatter from the lowest levels of the atmosphere. And so you're not, these noctilucent clouds, they're so thin because it's the ice crystals are so small, you just won't see them. So you have to wait for the sun. So I'm just going to show you stepping through as the sun is setting. You can see now that shadow of the earth coming up. So gradually the lowest parts of the atmosphere get lost in darkness. And then eventually you'll get to a point around about six degrees below the horizon. When the sun's six degrees below the horizon, you should start and be able to see the noctilucent clouds. But if you go too far and it's around about 16 degrees, if I just flip between those two, you can see then that eventually the noctilucent clouds themselves fall into the shadow of the earth. So there is a limit. You need to have the sun a bit below the horizon, but not too far below. So, okay, this is an example taken with a noctilucent cloud camera. And if you can see some spots there, these are actually stars. Unfortunately, I haven't put the time of this, but I'm guessing it would be about two o'clock ish in the morning. And two o'clock, by the way, GMT, not British summertime. And what you'll see then is these noctilucent clouds are still lit by the sun, whereas these, well, I call them regular, what I mean is tropospheric clouds, they're nominally in darkness, they're actually lit here by the lights of nearby Andover, um, but that's the basic geometry of what you need to be able to see noctilucent clouds. Okay, I'm just showing this one again because the next slide, I'm getting towards the end of what I'm showing you, is I'm going to focus on four latitudes to show you now. I've said that going further north, you're getting towards colder temperatures in the mesosphere, but you're, it's brighter because the sun doesn't get as far below the horizon. So the first latitude I'll focus on will be 51.15, so representative of southern England. The next one is going to be 45, so it's every three degrees. 44.15 is sort of northern England. 57.15 is sort of central to northern Scotland on, off the top of my map, Shetland. In fact, 61.15, I think, is pretty close to Lerwick in Shetland. And um, it goes off the top of this map, as I say. So what I'm showing here then is the well, okay, solar azimuth angle. That's not really important to the story, but here's the solar ele elevation angle. Um, and I've done the data here for summer solstice seen at various latitudes so that's zero degrees solar elevation angle so that's sunset and obviously anything above there is when the sun's still in the sky anything below there is when the sun is below the horizon and as i said it's between approximately six and 16 degrees below the horizon that you need okay 16 is maybe going a little bit too far but somewhere around there gives you the potential for visibility where the sky, the lower part of the sky is dark enough, you can see the noctilucent clouds, um, but you haven't yet lost the noctilucent clouds into the Earth's shadow. I've also put there, these dots are shown at one hour division. So if you were to look at sunset, you can see you've got to wait slightly less at the Southern England, it's slightly less than an hour um, before the sun is low enough. And that time increases slightly as you go further north, just because of the geometry of how the sun is moving. And you can see that in principle for southern England, if you were to get noctilucent clouds in the evening, in principle, they could last all night into the morning. And in, in practice, though, as I say, it's much more common to only see noctilucent clouds in the morning, or sorry, the dawn, more than in, during the dusk. 
Um, at the other extreme, though, so these um, sort of magenta line up at the latitude of Shetland is that at midsummer's or on the summer solstice, so midsummer's day or rather night, the sun's only just getting low enough below the horizon for noctilucent clouds to become visible. So on midsummer's day or night, you're basically you've gone too far north for Shetland, whereas at the beginning and the end of the season, say early June, late July, you're probably in a good place because you'll then be able to see further north and the cloud, the sky will be that little bit darker. So these are things, like I say, you can look up to find out um, for your latitude when is the best time to observe. And I'm, like I say, unfortunately, because it's the morning hours, it tends to be somewhere between about, I don't know, one thirty or so and... 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, um, GMT time that is, that's the time to see it. So it is, it, you have to be either dedicated, lucky, or in, as in my case, have an automatic camera so you can capture these things. So I've just got one or two slides left now. Um, what I've been showing you here, oh yeah, just going back very quickly to the difference, if you like, between the noctilucent clouds and the polar mesosphere summer echoes. So I've adapted this diagram from a paper in the literature. So the thick line there is showing you a sort of idealized temperature profile, and that thin line showing you the frost point. So what you would expect there is there is potential for ice to exist within that lilac colored region where the temperature profile drops below the frost point profile. Now to get noctilucent clouds you do need quite a deep region to be below the frost point and the reason for this so my thick blue line there or a darker blue line is showing nominal ice radius um, and what you can see here this is the sequence that you'll start to get ice nucleation preferentially around about the coldest point below the frost point and these very very small ice crystals will start to sediment vertically downwards under gravity. It's obviously they're going to be very light, but the atmosphere is very thin. And as they sediment, they'll grow. And towards the bottom of the region, if they grow as large as a few tens of nanometers, it's only at that point they will become visible as noctilucent clouds. And when they drop below that potential ice existence region, so when they drop to a region where the temperature is above the frost point, you'll get sublimation. So which means you're going straight from frost or ice straight into vapor phase. You're not going um, ice, liquid vapor, you're, you're going straight through. So you do need pretty deep region of cold temperatures to get noctilucent clouds. Now, by contrast, for the polar mesosphere summer echoes, in principle, they can occur at any altitude that's below the frost point. And so it's much easier to get these conditions. So you might only see noctilucent clouds a few times a season, say from southern England or even mid Wales region. And admittedly, a lot of that is to do with tropospheric cloud. It reduces your chances. Um, whereas with PMSEs, we might see like roughly 50% of days during the summer season, maybe slightly below that, but they're, they're, they're quite common. So one of the obvious questions, and I will be showing in a moment, I've done some work with an amateur spotter, John Rowlands, who lives in Anglesey, and he was the one who got me interested in looking at noctilucent clouds to see if it could tell me something about the PMSEs. And what we were hoping is that, obviously, noctilucent clouds, it's only dawn or dusk, whereas the PMSE is only during daylight hours, so they don't overlap in time. But we were hoping maybe, can we say, a good radar echo during the day, we, does that mean we're more likely to see noctilucent clouds the following night? And unfortunately, the answer is no. And I think it's really because you can get some, I've mentioned a lot of gravity waves, so you can get quite localized regions that will get cold enough for ice crystals for PMSE, but not for um, to get noctilucent clouds. I think the one time we got excited, though, is when we had one of the longest radar echoes we'd seen. That night, we really did get very um, noctilucent clouds coming quite far south, but uh, otherwise, the relationships are too poor to be of useful predictive value. And it's, it's a shame because nobody knows then which night do you want to stay out to watch noctilucent clouds in the morning. And so either you have to be an up an awful lot, or like I say, you need to be quite lucky. And if you're really lucky, you might catch it in the evening. Um, 
So I'm just going to finish off. One thing I, I'm conscious of, I've really focused on trying to give you some of the background of the, the sort of scientific background to this topic. And so I've neglected to show you really pretty pictures. And part of the reason is that the camera I operate is an automatic camera. So I deliberately go for wide angle and it, I just want to see where noctuous and clouds exist. Whereas this guy, John Rowlands, he's really keen and he goes out every night during the summer. And um, like I say, he lives in Anglesey, so he gets some really nice photos and he can do some nice close ups. And the final picture I'll show by him is just to show you this is a close up now. And I've mentioned about these gravity waves. And in fact, even in the troposphere, you will sometimes see clouds that have similar sort of features because there's gravity waves. Um, but this will be like, a, like I say, zoomed in and you, you get, can see there's an awful lot of detail, a lot of small scale pattern going on there. Now, I think that's the last of my slides. So, Paul, can I just ask, I, if we've got time, I'll just quickly show a couple of animations. I wanted to leave them out the main thing in case it crashes or something goes wrong. Um, yes, please if, go ahead. OK, let me just stop sharing and then reshare. Um, what I'm going to show you with these animations is, like I said, they're not the prettiest, but it, the first animation will show you one of the nights where we actually saw nocturnal and clouds during the dusk and then again during the dawn. It's not the most impressive display. And then the second display will just show you more typical um, during the dawn. So I'll talk you through. By the way, I unfortunately, I didn't have time to add some links at the end of this talk, but I will send Paul some links and the videos I'm going to show you, actually, you can, they're publicly available. And um, so you needn't scrabble to write down. It does actually show it, I think, on, let me share my screen again. Um, it has a URL on the title plate, but like I say, I'll send it to Paul afterwards. Now, can I find my video? Uh, okay, strangely, I can see there, but. Okay, does that come up a video on your screen? Not yet. Okay, I think it's because let me see if I can get them out of that. I'm not quite sure. I sort of know why. Oh. And now Microsoft wants me to do things. Okay, I will get that. Okay, what I'll do is I'll uh, okay, if I can't get this quickly, I won't bother, but Let me just try closing the video I've got open, which actually I think I've already done, which is probably why I couldn't see it. And I'll go back. Right, just give me a moment to stop the video if I can. Ah, okay. Now, if I can't get this to work, I will give up, but try sharing screen one more time. Don't think this is going to work. Is this sharing anything at the moment? It is, yes. Is that coming up with a video? No, it looks like it's something, some text out of focus. Um, okay, don't worry. Okay, what I'll do, I'm afraid, like I say, I, I don't want to drag this on. I will send you links and people will be able to see afterwards. Oh, let me just quickly. Now, I, for some reason, it's not showing up so yeah, video is often a challenge in these yeah, situations it, it, it's just getting it to pick the right window normally another way i could have done it can you stop okay i should stop sc screen share what i typically do when i give presentations i actually have a web browser way of doing videos um but i always think that pdf might go easier on this but it probably would have worked better had i shown it the old way so yeah i'm, I'm apologize for that at least i've well, I've run over somewhat. I've gone towards an hour. So um, that wraps up what I have to say. So I will bat that back to you, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. And I'd like to start with one from um, Mike, Mike German. Um, 
are meteor trails ever captured on the MST radar? Now, that's a good question. I did mean to mention it briefly. Basically, you get meteor radars, which often are very similar design to the MST radar. So they'll operate around about 50 megahertz. The one thing, though, that is different is for a meteor radar, you want a very wide beam. So you would, I showed you our MST radar is a one and a half degree, one way, half power, half width. To make a meteor, and that was 400 antennas. To make a meteor radar, you might just have four antennas, um, similar big ones like the Yagis I showed you. So you've got a much, much wider beam width, and then you want to see a large part of the sky. And the radar return mechanism is a bit similar. So you've got, well, there's, I, I'm not going to go into great detail because I'm not an expert, but you can get two mechanisms, but you do get basically the plasma trail left by the meteor. And you're picking out, again, structures, I think, with half the radar wavelength. Um, but I remember there are such things as head echoes, and then I think trail echoes. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but so in principle, we can see it. In the very early years, some people from Sheffield University actually built a little acquisition system to turn the MST radar into a meteor radar. Um, you do get some people operate bespoke meteor radars, and in fact, they use them largely to measure temperatures and winds up in around about that mesospheric, upper mesospheric region. Um, so yes, you, in, you sort of could see them with the same technology. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, are there any other questions? We've got time for another one. Okay. Um, again, thank you very much, David. In the um, in the olden days, we give you a, a round of applause in um, in appreciation, but uh, life is thank a little much. different now. <laughs> thank you so much for your time this evening and the time you took to um, put all that together for us. Appreciate it. Uh, it's just one final thing as well. I didn't put my email address, but I'll send to Paul like I say, some links of people who want to find out a bit more detail. I've got a few pages that have some details and I do intend to add more. Uh, we do often get people interested, particularly in the noctilucent clouds, who um, amateurs will come asking. So I'll make sure you can contact me and see those things. Yes, I'll forward your URLs and your email address on uh, following this meeting with the link um, for the uh, uh, video. Okay, yeah, it's always great when professional scientists share their time and knowledge and expertise with the, um, with the likes of us independent researchers. Um, okay, um, I'd like to hand over now to, uh, to Sandra, who is the uh, director of the uh, Noctilucent and Aurora section of the uh, BAA. Sandra, it's over to you. Yeah, oh, hi there. Can you hear me all right? We can indeed, yes. Right. Um, can we just go to share screen? I'll see how I get on. Uh, right. right. You got Ooh, something it's there? It's looking good. Yeah, we're there. Right. Here we go. How's that? Perfect. We've got your present. You're in presentation mode. Yeah, excellent. Right. Hi there. My name's Sandra Brantingham. Just the adverts first. What I do. I'm uh, Aurora and NLC director and council member for the British Astronom Astronomical Association. When I get my teeth in, uh, there's my web address. I also do the same job for the Society of Popular Astronomy. Um, I've been doing the Society of Popular Astronomy for about 15 years now, and the BAA side for about five years. So what do I do? Um, I let people know when there is an Aurora or NLC on, um, and I've got about getting close to 200 members now, and I can either send it just to the members or I can send it to the entire BAA, depending on how major it is. Uh, I collect and catalogue any reports sent in. Uh, I reply to any reporters sending in info or photographs. And that can be quite fun uh, in a busy night. I've had about over 60 
NLC sightings in one night. So <laughs> keeps me typing well into the early hours of the morning. And I supply any info requested by other scientific agencies. Um, and we have good relationships with several, uh, particularly uh, Cora Randall, who does the, the, uh, the ice and the mesosphere side of it. Um, right. So the team. Uh, this is myself. I'm the director. I also do the website. Uh, assistant director. And I noticed Kenya here. Uh, he does the NLC. Ken Kennedy um, just joined us um, and doing the radio side is uh, Jeffrey Greyer. Um, he's not actually in the BAA, but we get enormous help from Tom McEwen, who runs NLC Net, and uh, he gets reports all over Europe. Um, so combined together, we get reports right across the globe, really. Bits in Australia, the States most of Europe, uh, so it's very, very good. Uh, so let's have a quick look at Noctilus and Cloud side of it. Uh, this changed our world, basically, the AIM satellite. Um, it, prior to it, um, what we used to get was oh, a bit of a sighting. Now we get this lovely photograph. Now, the problems with the photograph, um, this one's taken on the 4th of July, and you can see this bits all the way down. However, you notice this bits cut off. Um, it's also about two to three days late, but we can live with that. It gives us a good idea of what's going on. So what do we get? Um, and I'll see a spectrum around about late May. So any time after the 20th of May, we expect to start to see noctilucent clouds. Uh, they last till late August, but to be quite honest, uh, sightings in August are very, very rare. Uh, and then, unless you live much further north, like into Greenland, you'll not see them uh, as it tends to retreat back quite, quite dramatically in the early days of August. Uh, starts in late November in the Southern Hemisphere yes, sometimes. This year, it started on the 14th of December. Um, there's a good description of why it did that, basically the winds, and there's a massive difference between the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere, basically caused by the fact that it's land surrounded by sea down there, and it's sea surrounded by land up here, so they have massive effects. And there's also, um, it, there's a sudden jump this year. We don't know whether that was the volcano or not, but that volcano made it through to the mesosphere, which is amazing. Um, but the, the jury's still out on that one. Um, and that'll last till late February, and it's actually just faded away just recently. It has a five-day rotation cycle, and we actually, you can see that on the satellite pictures quite clearly. It goes clockwise in the northern hemisphere and anti-clockwise in the southern. Um, but the satellite data is three days old, but roughly, if you say five days, that's roughly about 70 degrees per day. You can have a quick calculation if the bit's sticking out, there's a chance it might make it to you. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that. And it, like all clouds, it might form and then disappear and then form again. The sun must be, between, as uh, Dave said, must be between six and 16 degrees below the horizon. And as, as a, by his diagram showed, this can cause me great fun. And I can be sitting here and it's, it's, the sun's just setting and I've got phone calls from London and emails coming in saying, we've got noctilucent clouds. I said, yeah, it's still light up here. And they say, we know. Um, and so I'm sitting there with bated breath. And then uh, as the sun gets below six degrees, they appear. Um, just as a matter of interest, they were supposed to only be seen down to about 50 and uh, last year we got sightings down in Spain. So it's spreading. It's getting much, much more visible. Um, yet you don't have to be lucky to see them, by the way. Um, one thing, uh, and there's several people like this, um, you just have to have, um, shall we say, age, age of toilet habits i.e. get up at two o'clock in the morning, go to the loo and look out of the window. Oh, I saw Noctilucent Cloud. 
and you'll be amazed how many observers I have who do that. So yes, um, being lit by the sun, they're much brighter than the aurora. Um, if you're going to take photographs of them, it only takes about a second. You know, they, they're quite, quite sharp and quite, quite easy to see. Once you and I have people saying, "Oh, I can't tell the difference." If you see stars, and I noticed in one one of David's shots there was a star. Um, we know that one as Capella, uh, the patron saint of Noctilucent and Cloud Watchers. Um, so if you see the stars, then you've probably got Noctilucent and Clouds. But use a, a scientific... Uh, sorry, um, use a, um, what, any, any of the programs that will show you stars and check that the sun is below six degrees below, before you look. Once you've got that timing, um, they stand out a mile. And when you see them, they are really beautiful. They have an electric blue look to them. Excuse me a sec. Right. So, oh, it didn't show up. I just... No, I'll, I'll stay with this anyway. Um, I had a picture of the Aurora Noctilucent cloud. I'll show you it at the end. For some reason, it's dropped out. Um, basically, with the Aurora, the sun is a fire and the Aurora is its smoke. You talk to anybody, um, especially in the fire services, they'll tell you smoke is a very, very dangerous thing. And this smoke comes at a, at a minimum of 300 kilometers a second. Uh, and this is what it does. It comes screaming at us like that. Luckily, we've got the shields. Our magnetic field protects us from the worst of this. But as you see, it can, the, the solar wind, and that's what we call this, the, all these particles come along, mainly electrons, smash into our shield, go down, shake the tail, and the vibrations coming up the tail send electrons streaming in into the north and south magnetic poles. Now, we'll stress this is the magnetic poles I'm talking about. Although it's close to the North Pole, it can vary and has varied over centuries. So the magnetic poles can change and they can actually reverse. So, but, but that's where the main beds are directed. So basically the further north or the further south, the more likely you see aurora. You also need dark skies. Aurora is basically lit by itself. In other words, it creates its own light. So the weak Aurora, um, it's very, very difficult to see. So what do I look at? Now, there's two satellites. This is the Ace Mag and Swepham. This is the really old one. There's another one, but it's I can't copy it onto, onto the screen. Um, and that's the disk of. And basically what they do is they measure the speed of the solar wind here. They measure whether it's positive or negative. Um, they measure its density and its temperature. Now the critical one is this, but this can, can vary as well. Um, the speed's coming in normally at least 300 uh, from, from the various bits and pieces that sun does. It can be coronal holes, uh, magnetic explosions, or solar flares. And when the big solar flares come up, those, that speed can go right up. But the critical bit is this. If it's positive, it'll bounce off the Earth's magnetic field. If it's negative, it'll get through. And the more negative it is, the more chance that we've got of seeing the aurora. This is a lovely screen. Both of these are taken, by the way, from Space Weather. If, if you go onto Space Weather, you can get all these diagrams and you get a rough idea. You can see the green line. You can see I'm just about in there. I'm, I live just about here. If you're way down here, you, you haven't got much of a hope. Um, but there is a chance of seeing something else. And I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Uh, and that I found is fairly accurate. That is updated on the hour. So if you go onto space weather and you see this green bit and it's and it even has a yellow bit in here and comes further down and you're in. So what do you look for? 
Right, this is what you normally see, a picture with grids of green and stuff like that. So let me explain what you're looking at. You won't see the green. It will look white. Now, you've got to see orange clouds. Um, that's the aurora colonus or buckius. In other words, orange lights reflecting from the back. They have now gone all to LED, unfortunately, and therefore look whitish. So the whole thing looks whitish now. However, what you're seeing here is black clouds. Now, why are you seeing black clouds on the dark night? And this is a warning that you might see seeing aurora. It's they're being lit from behind. I had a friend who said, we were just sitting around uh, doing some observing, looking south and everybody was queuing up at a telescope, turned around and he looked at the horizon. He could see the horizon and he could see pylons. And he didn't realize what he was looking at, but the reason he could see the pylons was the sky was lit behind. And then somebody said, oh, the aurora's on. So if you see the horizon and for some reason it's lit, all right, it might be light pollution, but take a photograph anyway. You might be able to pull the aurora out. As it gets brighter, because your eyes see black and white at night, this will start to turn from white to green as your rods change over to cones. But normally when you first look at it, it will look white. And especially when you go out first outside before your eyes get used to looking at it. Um, right, just a few odd bits. And this is an example of black aurora. And it's, it's bits of stuff that's become new since I've been doing my job. Um, this is basically, electrons normally come down into the atmosphere, but this is electrons going back up. And they were discovered by the four cluster satellites. This is Samba, Salsa, Rumba, and Tango. They're called dancers because they move. And anyway, scientists wanted to sound nice and uh, trendy. So, and they actually flew through a belt of black aurora and discovered that it was a jet of electrons going out rather than down. And so we now know what causes that. Um, and that was discovered in 2001. Steve. Now, if anybody heard of Steve, then welcome to Steve. Um, he was named after a book character um, seen in the UK and Canada. It was the Alberta Aurora Hunters who actually named it. Um, Steve was um, something that they didn't know what it was. Um, it was called a proton arc. Well, we knew that wasn't the case because protons don't you can't see a proton arc. Um, it does it in ultraviolet and that can't get through the atmosphere. You can only see that on satellites. A stable auroral arc or an auroral comet. It actually does look like a comet. Um, and it was investigated by Professor Eric Donovan from the University of Calgary. Um, now he used the three swarm satellites. These were launched by the European Space Agency. Agency. All right, they look like vacuum cleaners. Yes, they are, but that's their job. They vacuum up bits of space and stuff like that and analyze it. And one of them went right through the beam, spot on. The beam was a jet of gas 25 kilometers wide at a height of 300 kilometers heading west. The surrounding gas was moving at 10 meters a second. The jet was doing six kilometers a second and was 3,000 degrees hotter. Now, as soon as you discovered that, um, it tied in with something called SAID. Now, you probably haven't heard of SAID. It's called Subauroral Iron Drift. And there were papers put out in the late 90s when the satellites started picking them up. And it's the movement of gas from east to west at high speed. We call it drift, but um, I, I give them the drift since uh, they're dealing with gas that's doing 300 kilometers per second out in space. So um 10 meters a second is 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 not bad so or oh, six kilometers a second is not bad um so it's but the, i went through those papers with a fine tooth comb but there was no mention of it being visible but it is now visible and we now know what we're looking at now the interesting thing for the, all of you living down south is you might not see the aurora but somewhere, and this seems to be about the time, it only lasts for about 80, 90 minutes. 
So the satellites often don't pick it up, but it it fires off at about what anywhere between 2030 and 2200, 2230, somewhere around that region. And it's in the west. Um, so if you're looking north and you're looking for the aurora, you can't see it, and you look at something and you see something that looks like a searchlight or pinkish, you might be looking at Steve. And that's what they decided Steve would stand for, strong thermal emission velocity enhancement. It's a nice mouthful, but there you go. But there's a good chance you'll see that further south. Right, a final plea. Um, if you're going to send in reports, and please send in any reports and if you've got them, uh, write your full name, say where you, you were in the town, use the double date, 11th, 12th, so we will know what night was on, put the pictures and attachments so I'm, I'm going to handle them easily, and send them to that address, sandra b at hotmail.co.uk. That's the lot now. If I, could, if I drop out of this... Uh, I might be able to find that photograph. Ah, yeah, hold on a minute. Is that the one? There you go. Now, this is a picture I took, and for some reason it didn't show on the uh, I was taking pictures of the Nocturnal Cloud, and it took me one second. And Sarah, I think you're sharing a different screen. We, we, we still got ah. the last, the, the first Have slide you? in right. your presentation. Right, hold on a minute. Right, stand by one. You'll need to unshare and then reshare. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, right. Where am I? Uh, for some reason. Should be at the top of the screen. If you go right to the top, it should say something like stop sharing. Oh, there's a new share. Ah, that's the one. That's the one I want. Got it? Yay. Good. Right. Right. Uh, and I was taking photographs of this, and the, the, the detail was great. I've got one that almost looked like an angel. Then I saw the aurora, and I thought, oh, I'll get them both together. So I took a picture, one second, nothing. So I increased it to two seconds, nothing. Five seconds, nothing. Ten seconds, nothing. Fifteen seconds, nothing. Twenty seconds before I got that. By which time, the Noctilucid clouds just look like normal clouds as you can see but this it shows you the massive difference but that was taken early august and that's your only chance either in may or august to get both of them together there you go that's my little bit uh if there's any questions but thank you very much paul yeah that's a lovely image uh sandra yes any questions for sandra Okay. Um, Alan has commented that there is a aurora visible in Elgin just now. Um, so he's at 57.6 degrees north. Yes, I, 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 there's a good chance it's on tonight. I was looking on, on the uh, space weather. There's a coronal hole strike occurring right now. Um, and so um, I was going to have a look out as soon as the meeting's finished. So I'm going to have a busy night of it, I think, and a long one. Okay, um, before I close the meeting, I'll give an opportunity for anybody to uh, come back with a question that you may have uh, thought of for either of our speakers this evening. No? Okay, um, thanks again, Sarah, for, uh, for sharing, and, and David, we wish you um, both well, and thank you uh, very much for your time. So until... The 1st of April is our next meeting when we're looking at um, fast gamma ray bursts. So until then, um, good night, everybody.